Number one, here are the graphs for functions f and g. Each represents the height of an object being launched into the air as a function of time. Which object was launched from a higher point? So we can see their starting values are here on the y-axis. And so this one, okay, being g, was launched from a higher point which object reached a higher point so which one made it to a higher um, point on the graph and we can see that based on their maximums and so this one up here is higher so that's from object f made it higher which object was launched with a higher upward velocity okay so this velocity is going to be the steepness um, that it was launched at. And so this object here is pretty flat and this one here is very steep and upward. So F is gonna be the one that was launched at a higher upward velocity. And then which object landed last? And so we can see where they land on the X axis. And so this is how much time it took. So after this much time, F had landed, and then this much time later, G landed. So G landed last. Number two, the function H given by this models the height of a ball in feet, T seconds after it was thrown. Find the zeros of the function. So when we're in factored form, the zeros are just gonna be what makes each of these factors equal to zero, because then zero times anything makes our whole function equal zero. So we can just solve these. I'll just do that down here. So we have one minus T equals zero. So we can just add T to both sides and we get one equals T. So one of our zeros is that T equals one. And then the other one is eight plus 16 T equals zero. So we can subtract eight from both sides and get 16 T equals negative eight. So then we can divide both sides by 16, which gives us that T equals negative 0.5. So that's another one of our zeros. Um, and then it says, what do the zeros tell us about the situation and are both zeros meaningful. So it tells us that um, the ball reaches the ground after these this amount of time. So it's when the ball touches the ground because it's what will make the overall function zero, meaning the height zero. So it's when the ball touches the ground. And only um, t equals one makes sense or is meaningful, okay? Because you're gonna launch it and you're not gonna go backwards in time. So a negative time measurement doesn't make sense. So the only one that's meaningful is the positive one or t equals one second. Then it says from what height was the ball thrown? So this is an initial height. So this is when our time equals zero. So no time has elapsed. So we can just plug zero into this function. So one minus zero times eight plus 16 times zero. And so one minus zero is one. 16 times zero is zero. And eight plus zero is eight. So then one times eight equals eight. So our initial height, or when we plug zero in for T, our initial height is eight feet. Then part D says, when does the ball reach its highest point, which is really asking for your vertex. And it's asking when, so it just wants the, the T coordinate or the X coordinate of your vertex. And we know that the vertex happens in the middle of the intercepts, right? So it happens right in the middle of these two values. And so we can just find the, the middle of those by doing one plus the negative 0 0.5 and then dividing that by two. And so one plus negative 0 0.5 is just 0 0.5. And then when we divide that by two, we get... Um, 
0.25 seconds. So just find the middle of your X intercepts and then that will be where the vertex is happening. So that's when it reaches that maximum point. Number three, the height in feet of a thrown football is modeled by this equation where T is measured in seconds. What does the constant six mean in the situation? And that's going to be your initial um, height that the ball was thrown at. Because again, if you plug in zero, if we do F of T, we'll get a zero for this. So this will be gone and we'll get a zero here. So then this will be gone. So F of zero will equal six, meaning the initial height of your ball is six. What does the 30 T mean in this situation? So this gives us our initial velocity, okay? Or the initial speed the ball was thrown. And then how do you think the negative 16 T squared affects the value of the function? So it's negative, so it's going to be decreasing, okay, or, you know, making the numbers go down. So decreasing the function, which makes sense because it's how gravity is um, impacting it. Um, so it's the effect of gravity. So like this six plus 30T would just be, if that just went unchecked with no gravity, that would just be going straight up at the same speed, but um, forever and never coming back down if there was no gravity. But then this negative 16T pulls it down. So it's trying to go up at this speed, that, but then gravity is impacting it and then pulls it back down to the ground. So that's what that negative 16T squared is doing. Number four, the height in feet of an arrow is modeled by this equation where T is seconds after the arrow is shot. When does the arrow hit the ground? Okay, and remember that the ground is going to be an x-intercept, right? So this is going to be an x-intercept or a zero of the function. So we know in factored form we can get the zeros from both of these. Okay, so one of them will likely make sense and one won't. So we'll set them equal to zero and solve for t. So subtract one from both sides, then divide by two, and we get that t equals negative 0.5 seconds. So that one's not going to make sense because we're not going to be looking at negative time. So then this next one, 18 minus 8t equals zero. I'm going to add 8t to both sides. So then we get 18 equals 8t, we can divide by 8, and we get that um, t equals 2.25 seconds, and that's going to be the one that makes sense. So this would be when the arrow hit the ground. And if we, you know, look at kind of what this means on a graph, okay, it means, you know, you're x-intercept back here would be at negative 0.5, and this one would be at 2.25. Then it says, from what height was the arrow shot? So this is your initial height, which means that you have um, a time value of zero, right? So really what we're figuring out is h of zero, if you want to think of it like that. So we're doing one plus two times zero, so we're just plugging zero in here and here, and two times zero is zero, and then 18 minus eight times zero, which is zero. So really we're getting one times 18, so our initial height is 18 feet. Number five, two objects are launched into the air. The height in feet of object A is given by this equation, and the height in feet in object B is given by this one. 
in both functions, T is the number of seconds after the launch. So which was launched from a greater height? So remember when it's multiplied out like this, the initial height is just the constant value. So F of T is being launched at four versus G of T is being launched at, at 2.5. So object A is going to be the one launched at a greater height. And we know that because F of zero equals four and that's greater than G of zero, which is gonna be 2.5. And then which object was launched at a greater upward velocity? Okay, so that velocity is gonna be in your T term. So this one's being launched at 32 feet per second. And this one is being launched at 40 feet per second. So this is gonna be object B because 40 is greater than 32, right? Number six, predict the X and Y intercepts of the graph of the quadratic function described by this, and then explain how you made your predictions, and then you're gonna check them. So we wanna find the X and the Y intercepts. So if it's in factored form, then our X intercepts are just gonna be when the whole function equals zero, meaning when each of these terms equals zero, or sorry, each of these factors equals zero. So I'll just separate them, set them equal to zero, and then solve. So X equals negative six is gonna be one, add six to both sides, and we get X equals six as the other. So these are gonna be our X intercepts. And then the Y intercept um, is gonna be when the um, function, when you plug zero in, so the y-intercept is when your time or your x or your initial value equals zero. So we plug zero in for x to get the y-intercept. So then we're having zero plus six, which is six, and zero minus six, which is negative six, and multiplying those. So our y-intercept is going to be negative 36. And then we can graph this to see if we are correct. And you can see the x-intercepts are here at negative 6 and positive 6. And then the y-intercept is down here at negative 36. Number 7, a student needs to get a loan of $12,000 for the first year of college. A bank has an annual interest rate of 5.75%. Bank B is 7.81 and bank C is 4.45. If we graph the amount owed for each loan as a function of years without payment, predict what the three graphs would look like. Um, and so, you know, they're going to be exponential. They're going to start at the 12,000, right? So that starting value is going to be 12K for each of them, 12,000. Okay. Then they're going to be exponential because we're talking interest. So if we just graph this one as bank A, the 5.75%, bank B is a higher percent. So that's going to be going up faster than A is. So that one's going to be above A. And then C has a lower interest rate than both of these. So C is going to be below both of them. So something like that, where B is the top one, A is going to be in the middle, and C is going to be in the bottom or underneath them. Then it says use graphing technology to plot each graph of the loan. And then we want to decide how much the student owes after four years and 10 years at each bank. So if we look, here's the graph. And then we want to estimate what they owe at four years and at 10 years. So let me just draw in, here's four years. And then here's 10 years. And then we can kind of look at where each of these are. So for bank C, after four years, were here. Okay, so here's 10,000, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So 
bank C after four years is about um, 14,000. Then bank B after 14 years or after four years. So, or sorry, bank A. So I'm going to go to this middle one. So bank A looks to be right between, um, what is this? 12, 14, 16, between 14 and 16,000. So I would say bank A is at about 15,000 after four years. And then bank B is that top one. So bank B here is just a, at about 16,000. So then this is after four years. So then if we do a similar idea um, after 10 years, we can see what each bank owes. And bank C, so here is 10 years. So bank C is like a little over 18, you know, but maybe about 19,000. You're just guessing based on the graph. Okay, so about 19,000. A would be um, here, so maybe 21,000, because remember each square is 2,000 on this scale. So bank A, or from bank A, it would be about 21,000. And then bank B, here's after 10 years, if we didn't make any payments, and that's 22, 24, almost 26,000. So about 26. So you can kind of see the differences in each of those um, interests there. Number eight, the functions f and g are given by f of x equals 13x plus 6 and g of x is equal to 0.1 times 1.4 to the x. Which function will eventually grow faster, f or g, and explain how you know? Well, it's going to be g because it's exponential, right? So exponential is always going to overtake linear um, as long as it's exponential growth, which it is because this is higher than one. So we know that this is exponential growth. So at some point, it's going to overtake this linear function that's just going to keep growing at a constant rate. Then it says use graphing technology to decide when the graphs of F and G will actually meet. So if you graph both of these, um, you can either if you're doing it on Desmos, you can actually just click on the intersection and see when they'll meet, um, or you can just guess about when they'll meet. So sometime, you know, around 14 and a half. So at this one, we can see that it's um, after 14.559 if we wanted to get that specific. Um, so when x equals that, then both functions will be 195.269. But if you want to say somewhere between 14 and 15, that's probably fine too.